Hello, everyone. Hi. Can everyone, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the third in Alexandra Palace's Culture Bubble webinar series. Um, this is the Culture Bubble, the contemporary stage. Uh, these webinars are a space for young people to discuss and explore activism in all of its creative and its cultural forms. Um, you can watch the first two webinars through the links on Alexandra Palace's website in the creative learning section. Uh, Jen will uh, link that uh, in the chat for you guys. Uh, today, you're going to hear from an all-female panel of contemporary theatre makers in a discussion about the state of the contemporary stage. Um, each speaker is breaking new grounds in the fields of verbatim theatre, community theatre, underrepresentation on the stage, and carbon neutralizations. Hello, uh, my name is Georgina, and I'm going to be your host today. Um, I'm a member of the Young People's Programming Team at Ali Pali, uh, who have, amongst other things, organised this series of webinars. Uh, it's just about time to hear from all of our four, pa four panellists, but before we start, I'd just like to remind you that we've got closed captions um, available if you'd like to use them. Uh, this webinar will also be recorded, and so do remember, um, if you have any questions for the panel, uh, you can put them in the Q&A function, function sorry, uh, at the bottom of your screen and we will answer as many as we can. First up is Helen. So Helen Monks is an actor, writer, and the co-artistic director of the theatre company Lung. Uh, founded in Barnsley in 2012, Lung is a campaign-led uh, verbatim theatre company that tours work nationally. Uh, they work closely with different communities to make verbatim theatre and hidden voices heard. Uh, Lung creates work that shines a light on political, social and economic issues in modern Britain, using people's actual words to tell their stories. Lung's work is published by Bloomsbury uh, and they have a strong partnership with Leeds Playhouse, the Lowry, Battersea, uh, the Lowry and Battersea Arts Centre and have developed work at the National Theatre Studio. Helen? Hello. Hello. I reveal my face. It's like the mask. Hello. Hi. <laughs> thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Bless you. And um, thank you for an excuse thank to shower you. this morning. It was really, it's really great. Although I've got a new conditioner that's accidentally permed <laughs> my hair, so I don't know what's quite happening. Um, oh my god! I can't. I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> thank you for that introduction. Um, that was literally perfect. I'm going to do a classic screen share. Um, to tell everybody a bit about the Theatre Company Lung and the work that we make. Um, here we are. So these are some actors, um, as well as a campaigner from the Focus E15 campaign on one of the shows that we did marching from, from Clapham Junction Station, if anyone knows it, up to Battersea Arts Centre where the show was and the audience kind of marched with us into the, into the theatre. And I'm going to just talk briefly a bit about how um, we mix campaigning and, and theatre together and the line is often really blurry. Um, you've read all of this out, so I'll skip over it, but um, this is our sort of manifesto, and we've also snuck in there a bit of uh, humble bragging as well about the work that we've done. Um, but yeah, the kind of idea is that it's really campaign-led, that it's wider than just the play that itself and verbatim is really key to what we do. Um, we work with real people and it's their real words that form the basis of the script. So I'm just going to do a real like quick whistle top um, whistle top, whistle stop tour through our different um, shows and the different work that we've made. So you can kind of, I always think when you talk theoretically about stuff, it's kind of hard to get a sense of it. So I thought I'd just talk about the actual practical work that we've done. So this was our first show, show the 56, which was made about the Bradford City fire, which was a big fire that happened in 1985 in um, Valley Parade Stadium at a football game. And um, one of the things was that no one had really spoken about it before. So the co-writer Gemma was a big Bradford City fan, um, but from a younger generation didn't really know much about the fire that had happened. So the play was almost a, a piece of memorial theatre of, of sharing stories of the day. Um, and it was performed at the stadium on the anniversary of the fire. And also there was a big push around the show to raise money for Bradford Burns unit. Um, and it's where we first kind of got a real feel for how verbatim theatre can have that really electric feel when audience members are in the space, listening to their own words um, and also listening to relatives words. There was this sort of thing where some people were anonymous, but then suddenly heard the voice of their dad or something that they were sure a relative had said. Um, 
and the kind of power of bringing it back to remembering that this is that this is real and this is their real kind of history and shared story. Next, we did E15. Here I am in the poster. Uh, this was my moment where I realised not to put myself in my own shows. Um, some people can do it, but for me, uh, it was just too much work. Um, but this was a play about the housing crisis. Um, and we worked with this absolutely amazing campaign you saw in the picture at the beginning called the Focus E15 campaign. They're a housing, they're a housing group, a group of um, young women who were all living in a mother and baby hostel. They were all evicted from the hostel and not given anywhere else to live. So they set up this campaign, fought for their right for social housing and ended up winning. This was a really interesting show. Um, this is the real campaign because we, we knew we wanted to make a show about the housing crisis and we were based in Sheffield at the time and we went to this um, huge housing estate in Sheffield um, that some people might know it's right by the station, it's Park Hill Estate. But the problem with that estate is everybody had been evicted and moved out so there wasn't anybody to talk to. And so we actually sort of knew the subject first and then found the real life story second and we ended up joining this campaign and still are a part of it but the process of making the show was two years of being on the streets and um, going to their regular street stall and going to housing occupations and so all the interviews we did were part of that live campaign so the script is very live and feels very present tense and here you can see is the show which as you can see we sort of we use the real banners of the campaign and we asked other housing campaigns to donate banners to make the set a real active um, space uh, we, we, this was the real petition of the Focus E15 campaign. We were really trying to galvanise audiences to join the campaign and to sign the petition. Next, we did Chilcot. Sorry, I'm really whizzing through it. Um, but Chilcot, we, um, we wanted to mark the, there was a big inquiry into the war in Iraq and Chilcot was that inquiry. And we wanted to mark the date that the inquiry got launched. So we created what we sort of, called the People's Chilcot, which was a really distilled version of the actual transcripts of the Chilcot inquiry. So this is another form of verbatim that you can do where you take real transcripts and you sort of distill them down into an evening of theatre. Because I think sometimes things can be so overwhelming, it's hard to keep track of the news, but if you can really make it clear in an evening of theatre, um, then it gives people a bit of ownership over what they understand. Um, but also the play intercut with the testimony of the inquiry, people who hadn't been called to the inquiry, but we felt should have a voice. So this is Rose Gentle who lost her son um, in Iraq. And there were also um, military families against war, Iraqi refugees um, and veterans for peace, voices from those groups. And here's what the set looked like. As you can see, it was trying to sort of really make it as close to the reality as possible. Next we did Who Cares? Sorry, I'm literally like doing a biography, but um, this, was a, this was a show made with four absolutely amazing young carers. So young people who look after a relative um, living in Salford where we were associate artists at the Lowry. It was made as a co-production with the Lowry. Um, and this play has had a lot of different lives, but the aim of the show was to identify hidden young carers. So young people who are a carer, but don't realize that there's a term for it and that there's support out there. So the idea was that the show toured around schools, um, community settings, uh, youth zones, and identified hidden young carers and then um, signposted them to support from their young carer service. The play again is verbatim as they all are. And the young people, it wasn't just that their words formed the basis of the script, they helped design the set, they helped cast the show and their music formed the soundscape. This has just been on the radio, a little plug for you, it's still on BBC Sounds. Next we had Trojan Horse, which um, was working with teachers and governors in Birmingham who'd been accused of um, Islamizing their schools was the way the papers put it. Um, they were accused of a plot to sort of take over schools and radicalize children. Um, we really wanted to hear their side of the story. So we worked really closely with the teachers and governors who'd been accused. And again, there was a real campaign element to the show because their sort of side of the story had, had never been told um, and had always been skewed by the media. Um, that is it. I'm going to stop talking at you and stop my share. Um, but like I said, I wanted to give you a sense of the work that we do rather than just the ethos of the company, because I think the work sort of gives you an idea of what the aims of the company are. The fact that it's always campaign driven and it's always using real people's voices to tell their own stories. Thank you very much.
Oh, thank you so much, Helen. That was really wonderful. Um, next up, we've got Hetty. Uh, Hetty is uh, an executive producer and associate director at Pigfoot Theatre. Um, Pigfoot is a multi award winning theatre company dedicated to making collaborative carbon neutral theatre. Pigfoot rejects the current systems that we live in but embraces ecosystems and global connectivity. Pigfoot make devised work with and for those grappling with climate and ecological crisis, as well as running workshops for schools, young people and theatre makers. Hetty, hello. Hello, is this is this good? Can you hear me? Hi. Cool. Hi. Um, yes, I can hear you. Amazing. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. Firstly, it's really cool to be here amongst some really amazing people who I really admire. Um, so I'm really looking forward to um, what today, this evening holds. Um, so I'm a freelance director and theatre maker, but I also co-run Pigfoot, which as Georgina very kindly said, is the UK's first explicitly carbon neutral theatre company. Um, so, so far as a carbon neutral theatre company, we've made two shows. The first one's How to Save a Rock, and the second one that we're currently developing is Hot in Here. I'll come back to them in a moment, but I'll just talk to you more about becoming a carbon neutral theatre company to start off with. So I co-run Pigfoot with B, um, and I only started to work on work with Pigfoot about a year and a half ago, and this was when Pigfoot was already a carbon neutral company. But Pigfoot's not always been a carbon neutral company. So Pigfoot started in 2017, um, and they were doing a big show, a big regional uh, theatre in Oxford with a huge stage, normal like lighting rig and everything. Um, and I, I'm telling the stories of it happened to me, but it happened to B. But B was directing this show um, and they were in tech. And one of the technicians just said, oh, as everyone is like out on dinner at the moment, do you mind if I just turn out the lights? It's just it uses quite a lot of energy. Um, and in that moment, B like started to think about the impact that theatre has on the climate crisis. So then when they started to devise How to Save a Rock in 2018, a show that was always going to be about the climate crisis, um, they like questioned uh if we're going to make a show about the climate crisis why not make it as climate friendly as possible and then i joined and um we've been like we we are we're carbon neutral now and we only make work about uh the climate and ecological crisis so what we do is we want to create theater which practices what it preaches and we hope to like protest from within an industry which in london alone and this was uh research from a couple of years ago um but there hasn't been any more um investigations into it since has a carbon footprint in London of 50,000 tonnes a year which is roughly equivalent to driving a car 1.5 million times around the M25 and that seems like insane for us because theatre is such like a um it challenges it has such an important role in challenging things that are wrong about our society but it's really perpetuating that in having such a large carbon carbon in impact so if we want to be like a loving caring um and passionate uh industry we need to not do things that are bad for the planet and in, and and the planet and the people who live on it um so that's sort of where we're coming from in being carbon neutral as a company um so as a carbon neutral company we've made two shows so far as i said so i'll quickly talk you through both of them um so how to save a rock uh, was our first show and it started and it went to the national student drama festival and then went to edinburgh fringe with pleasant went to volta festival and we were meant to be touring it uh, this this spring um but obviously we're not touring it this spring um so we're making a film of it uh, we're actually starting making a film of that next week um with the amazing slung low um and then are touring it to sort of community venues around the UK and schools um, and so that is a bike powered family comedy about how to still have hope it's like a silly fun uh, family kids show about saving the last polar bear on earth um, so it's as with all our shows it's entirely carbon neutral the lighting for this show is powered by solar power and a bike cycled live on stage all the music uh, happens live and production materials are recycled and recyclable um, so Hot in Here is our new show, um, which was commissioned by Camden People's Theatre um, and is about climate justice. So the, cl the climate crisis is currently disproportionately affecting uh, people living in the global south and people nearest the equator. Um, so Hot in Here, um, to make Hot in Here, we've been working with a group of young people in Camden um, and connecting them to interview people uh, 
climate activists living all around the world um and so in doing so we're like sharing their stories um and discussing like the climate crisis that they're facing right now and sh yeah sharing that um and so in doing so we hope to like empower the young people that we're working with um to be like connected to these global climate activists um and to uh, share and amplify the stories of some incredible action climate action taking place across the world to mitigate the crisis so the final thing before i pass on to uh, everyone else um is just to quickly talk you through how we're carbon neutral um so that we're not before I say this, I, I always want to say that you can't, you can't necessarily always do everything and we're constantly learning. So for example, something that we are learning right now is about the digital carbon footprint, which is really big and not lots of research on it. So we're currently trying to like research that and how we can min minimize and mitigate our carbon footprint when, for example, we're on Zooms and things like that, or we're sharing digital work, but because that's not been at the forefront of our work until now, it's only now that we're really, really beginning to delve deeper into that. So to say that we're not absolutely perfect um, and nor would we claim to be, but we're doing everything that we can to be carbon neutral. Um, so with all our set and props and materials, we ask where they come from and where they're going. So it means all our materials are recycled and recyclable. So we ask, yeah, we ask what, what, what life they live before and what life they'll live after. Um, we offset all unavoidable costs. So this might be like lights on in rehearsals. It might be how long we use our laptops for. It might be like this presentation right now. Um, and we're looking currently into we're, we're constantly evolving the way that we offset because there are some ways that you can offset which are worse for both the planet and for the people living on it. it like yeah there's lots of problems with carbon offsetting so it's really important to look into the ways that you're offsetting if you're going to do that um and then our final thing is that we power the light and sound um by renewable energy so Obviously, in an ideal world, this would be through like going to venues that were all powered by renewable energy, but that's just like simply not the case in the industry that we're in. Um, so that means we have to generate our own energy live on stage. So for I'll share my screen now while I discuss this, if it works. Um, is that working? Can you see the PowerPoint? Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is our. This is how to save a rock, which was powered by a bicycle generator. Which, if you can see the bikes and you can see the lights, those bikes are directly powering those lights. Um, and this is when we took the bike into a school, and the kids all get to like use the bike, and they love that because um, you can see the direct impact of the bicycle powering the, the dynamo, which is the kinetic energy that powers the lights. And then for our new show, Hot in Here, we are creating a um, energy harvesting dance floor. So the kinetic energy of the movement of the performers' bodies. This will be much bigger. We've only we've only uh, developed three squares at the moment because it's still a work in progress. Um, but as they move together, it will charge the batteries, which the secondhand batteries, uh, which power the lights. Um, and that's more of that. And we also can experiment with things like because 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 you can't produce as much light as you normally would with the show. We like to see these as like creative opportunities. So for example, we've been experimenting with like what extra disco balls and mirrors and stuff can do to produce more light but that is pretty much us um so thank you so much again for having me and i will um pass on to whoever is next thank you so much hetty that was super interesting um so next up we've got beth so Beth Sitek, uh, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, is a queer northern freelance arts producer making work across theatre, cabaret and live events. So Beth's work is invested in facilitating original work from artists who merge genres and cross forms whilst engaging with communities as part of the making process. Uh, Beth is particularly interested in amplifying intersectional queer and feminist work that is personal, political and provocative. Nice alliteration there. Uh, a lot of Beth's work involves working with arts collectives, performance artists, theatre companies, festival teams, venues and LGBTQ plus 
spaces. Uh, she strives to form a really strong collaborative bond with every artist that she works with, uh, working to implement sustainability and development of practice. Uh, Beth is also a fierce advocate for early career artists and a queer performance artist and drag king uh, who makes climate activist work about human nature and the animal kingdom. Beth, did I get all that? You're describing someone mental. Who's that? <laughs> No, that's perfect. <laughs> that describes me perfectly, I, I guess. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for the intro. It's really lovely to be here. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I guess I'll just talk a little bit about me, um, just to give you an idea of kind of um, where my activism comes from and just a better idea of, of my work and, and what I do. Um, so I am a freelancer. I've only ever been freelance. I've never worked for an organisation. Um, and yeah, so I started, I graduated from the University of York two years ago, might even be three now, 2018, um, in theatre, writing, directing and performance and kind of came out of that course, didn't really know what I wanted to do. And then my mate Fizz was like, do us a favour, produce my show at Edinburgh. And I was like, you know, I love Edinburgh. I was like, totally, like, how hard could it be? Ended up producing it and absolutely loved it. Um, and then kind of from there, I just kind of like fell into quite literally um, producing. Um, I think, yeah, like the things that I love and what I pride myself on doing is, is really supporting artists and um, thinking about how we can be as sustainable as we can be in an industry, which is, you know, actually really hard to get into. Um, and I kind of worked my way up from there. Um, so I do stage managing sometimes, and that was just to kind of subsidize my work as a producer. I would say I only started working as a producer properly within the last kind of like year or so without having to subsidize it with anything else. Um, I do some drag king on the side. Um, sadly, I don't make, make a living out of that. I would love to, I would love to do that, but not just yet. Um, and I just kind of like got into producing and started making an income from literally just taking on whatever, whatever I could. Um, and I think that's partly like where my enthusiasm comes from to advocate for early career artists. Um, so I was a part of the National Freelance Task Force um, about six months ago now. Um, and I was appointed um, to kind of like do whatever I want. And the whole point of the freelance task force was that it was initiated by Fuel Theatre. Um, and it was made up of over 160 freelancers across the UK. Um, and we kind of had one, one shared goal, which was to advocate for freelancers in the industry and kind of, and kind of like do things that are passionate, like that we want to see in the industry change. Um, and, you know, I've only kind of been working for the past two to three years and it's been through really hard graft. It's been through making sacrifices. Um, and I was like, I really want to dedicate this time to, to early career artists. So what me and my colleague Zora King did was we wrote an open statement to organizations that went out to them addressing the things that early career artists need now, both in a pandemic and in the future. Um, and we really tried to make sure that that letter wasn't confrontational, it was collaborative, it was open, but also it kind of really hit home the fact that, you know, in this industry, organisations hold it. You know, the people like me, freelancers, we make up like eight, like 60 percent of it, but it's only when I'm legitimised by an organisation do I get work. So it's kind of like part of my activism is kind of going like, well, how can we challenge that power play in a really kind of like collaborative way? Um, so that's kind of what the letter aims to do. And we kind of got it signed by over like 12 organizations. Since then, we've had um, consultations with each of them going like, what are you actually doing now to ensure that early career artists are being heard? Um, a lot of my work is about direct um, kind of um, yeah, consultations with the artists. So instead of making work or kind of like trying to do something for a community, we should just ask. And I think the best work that is made is, is are the ones that's consulted on. Um, and then from there, we're trying to figure out how to how to carry on um, these conversations because I think we were so adamant in that we were like, this can't just be something that people sign and forget about. Like, too much that happens too often. It, it, it needs to be something that is sustainable and actually um, early.
through it are um, getting them arts council funding I'm an access support worker for the arts council so do my best to try and support people in that process um, and specifically making work across theatre cabaret and live events um, and I really like things that are merging genres quite weird like interdisciplinary um, and have been part of I've done like you know all the fringe festivals and done CPT and the Albany Vault Festival, the Pleasance, the Royal Court. Um, and yeah, I think like I'm very much just still on this journey about um, navigating the industry because it's so pivotal to my practice as I guest lecture at the University of York as well about also kind of opening up the gates and trying to kind of like get, get, um, get, well, just kind of like grads or early career artists through the door. And I think that the most important thing that I've learned is that in this industry, we always tend to say that early career artists are under 25 when that's not the case at all. And I think actually this pandemic has really helped us open up those gates. And I actually think there's more empathy than there ever has been. And I think that's really, really exciting. And I think um, now is a really interesting time to get conversations moving and to sustain them and support artists who are the future of our, of our industry more than ever. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Beth. That was really interesting. Um, so lastly, but absolutely not leastly, leastly is not a word, but you know, whatever. Uh, Abigail, we've got Abigail. Uh, so Abigail Sewell uh, is a film and theatre director and co-founding and a founding director of Uproot Productions. Uh, Uproot is a socially driven cross arts production company who support black artists in developing experimental and political stories that represent the breadth of our lived experiences. Um, Abigail's work is driven by the transformative power of storytelling. Uh, her passion lies in reaching new audi audiences with untold stories that reflect and challenge society. She's motivated by arts potential for collective healing and specializes in working with young people and community groups as a drama facilitator. Abs, welcome. Oh, muted. Hi everyone. Oh, you're good. Um, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the, the lovely intro, Georgina. Um, so yeah, I guess just kind of following from that, um, I'll just start by talking a little bit about um, my work um, as an individual, and then I'll get on to speak a bit more about Uproot Productions. Um, and so I think that our values obviously align, and so it's useful to get an insight into myself as an individual. Um, so it's always strange hearing about yourself, um, hearing it reflected back, um, but that is, <laughs> that is me, that is who I am. Um, so in terms of um, the work that I make, I am a freelance film and theatre director um, and I work across film and theatre. Um, I'm starting to focus a bit more on film more recently, so my background is predominantly in theatre. Um, and I don't think I've ever told a story that doesn't centre black women in some way. Um, and it often centers the joy of black women um, because I think that often um, when we're telling stories that are in some way related to race, it's often the struggle stories or the trauma stories that are um, showcased, which I think has a lot to do with the interests of the, um, the producers or the programmers. Um, but I think that it's actually really important for black people to see ourselves, well, for all of us really, to see ourselves represented in, in a broad way. Um, and with Uproot, part of our mission is to tell stories that represent the breadth of our lived experiences. Um, representation is what tells you who you are before you learn to articulate that for yourself. And it also tells the world who you are. And so storytelling is actually really powerful um and i've i've learned that even more so through working as an artist um but i think that even um those of us who engage um as audience members solely um will will we'll recognize that there's this feeling isn't there when you leave the theater and you've just seen this show and it speaks to you in some sort of um some sort of impactful way and sometimes it really does leave that that lasting impact 
Um, and so I think consequently, I'm really interested in reaching new audiences. Um, it's all part of the same thing, really. I think to tell these new stories, they need to be reaching the right people. And it's really easy with film, for instance, to, um, you know, anyone can just watch it from their home. But I think with theatre, um, marketing and targeting your, your audiences can become slightly more challenging, um, particularly when there are um, audiences who historically have not felt welcome. Um, or not felt catered to. Um, and so I think that, yeah, I wanna tell, I'm not even gonna say new stories. I'm just gonna say underrepresented stories to um, audiences who are um, often not reached. Um, and th there is a real healing aspect of that because I believe that through telling these stories that we can raise the racial esteem of one another and of, of black people. Um, because I think that when you see yourself reflected in a certain way, um, or when the world tells you who you are, um, you it can limit yourself and your self view. But there's something about, um, I think the, the greatest like example of this is Black Panther. Like I just love seeing like young and Black Panther isn't necessarily the sort of sto story that I myself want to tell, um, but I think that there's just something so powerful about seeing young black children um, just looking up to the characters and just knowing that they too can be superheroes. Um, if that's not power, then yeah, I don't know what it is. Um, and in my work as well, I, I often work um, as a facilitator with communities and young people, um, primarily with um, National Youth Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and so a bit more about Uproot, um, I'm founding director of the organisation and it's a socially driven cross arts production company um, that Stephen Kavuma and I launched last year after the success of This Is Black at Bunker Theatre. Um, and our work really has three strands, which is artistic creation, artistic development and artistic outreach. Um, and so creation is just really telling those new stories. Development is about um, offering new opportunities for artists and ensuring that black artists aren't overlooked or are empowered to just to do the work that they're already like so brilliant at. And then outreach is slightly more about um, using arts um, in either therapeutic spaces um, or in spaces that um, are just more well-being focused or about targeting um, targeting people outside of the typical theatre space, I would say. Um, and so last year in December, we launched, well, actually we launched the company in August, so we're kind of new anyway, um, but we launched This Is Black 2.0 in December, which um, was an interactive digital exhibition, which featured short films, poetry, photography, and critical writing from 10 brilliant black artists. Um, and that um, piece of work was in response to uh, the murder of George Floyd and all of the tensions that arose throughout 2020 that, to be honest, obviously existed before, but um, it just felt like we were really in a pressure cooker. And I think with the, um, the backdrop of COVID, which we have seen um, has discriminated based on um, class and race. Um, and so, yeah, that, that project um, served as a, an artistic outlet and, a, and an expression. Um, and we also are currently running a training program called um, Uproot Connect, which um, it offers a space for um, 10 black artists who are who were at risk of leaving the industry for various reasons um, space to train but I'll talk a little bit more about that later um, yeah I, I want to show you a little snippet of um, just the start of this is black um, I was having some real technical difficulties earlier so I'm going to give this a whiz I'm rooting for it I'm approaching this with confidence I believe that this is going to go really successfully so just give me a moment while I try and share my screen. <laughs> I'm getting like hype in the chat that you lot can't see. <laughs> the panel is like, yeah, it's gonna work. It is gonna work. It so is gonna work. Okay, I can do it. Sharing screen. 
optimizing for video clip. Share. Okay. Can you hear? Yeah. Yes, amazing. <laughs> There's actually a password bit, but it didn't prompt me because I've just entered it, but it was password protected. Um, and then this is the first um, short film run. So it's all interactive like that. And then I'm not gonna play it just because of time, but this is the first of the, there are three short films um, and various other um, pieces of art that we shared, but that just gives you a kind of sense of what the, um, the event was like, um, yeah. And that's, that's me and that's Uproot. Amazing. Thank you so much, Abigail, for super amazing branding and just everything towards um, Uproot Productions, really interesting stuff. I mean, yeah, that's, that's all the introductions out the way. Um, so we've got some really interesting questions. Um, I've got some that, that um, everybody can answer and then some that are like specific to each of our panelists. So what I'll do is I'll start with the question that everyone can answer. Uh, so my question is, why is it important to you to use theatre to speak out about political, social and environmental issues? And what can young people make sure um, do to make sure that their creative activism isn't just performative? Who wants to go? <laughs> well, now we're going to be really polite, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Go on, someone put me out my misery. I I can give my two pence. I um I think um when I heard this question, I think um what kind of sprung to mind for me was like how for me like my job and like theatre and like the stuff I do is so integral to community. And I think that actually like the reason why I got into theatre was because I went to Edinburgh Fringe and it changed my life. And I think that like without that kind of environment and that sense of kind of like collective, I don't even know if it's like excitement, but it kind of just really got me into what I'm doing. And like in everything that I produce, I always try and work with the artist to go, how are we rooting this within reality? Like, I think it's so easy to go clap, 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 the show's over, wasn't that nice, go home. When in fact, like it should be, rooted within the people that the, the story what what what's the story concerning who is this for like and I think it's about engaging the audience in a way that is like it sounds so cheesy but it's like I I try and make work that isn't like theatre it's, it's just something that happens and it's it's organic it's exciting and it feels like real life so I think like for me it's all about knowing who my community are and taking them with me at every single point in the project and trying to get the artists that I work with and support to do the same and think of community less as an audience and kind of breaking it down and making it actually way more real and way more genuine. We do some, um, sorry Hattie, we both... <laughs> It's like one of those drama exercises where you count to 10 without interrupting each other. Um, we, um, one of the things that's totally changed my mind that we didn't used to do, but we've started doing with our last couple of productions is interdisciplinary collaboration. So working with people who aren't theatre makers, and that can be like a whole range of stuff, but for us campaign groups has been a big one because their, to their mind is totally blown by the way that you tell stories and make work because their campaigning is often not arts focused, but also we've just been completely like transformed in the way that we think about stuff by working with those people and academics as well as a, is a big one that I used to always really avoid because I always thought they were really stuffy. But if you find an academic that actually is really interested in the thing that you're researching, it's just a different way of, of putting that work out there they write a really intense detailed article about it and you make something that you know people want to go and watch and, and it's the same it's often the same material it's just different formats so I think that can be really exciting because then you're working with people with really shared aims and shared objectives but also we always ask ourselves why this play why now and why me and make sure that you're doing you know you're like 
Beth sort of said you're really passionate about the subject to start with I think and that your aims are bigger than just making a show sometimes you want to just make a show but if you're if you're kind of making an activist piece of theatre I think you really need to be invested in the the outcomes outside of the play itself I'll stop talking now I think kind of on that um that like idea of community that Beth was talking about um I think that there's something about being together in like a theatre experience as like a collective experience and being together in your act activism I think that there's something that it's like so easy within activism to be like oh I can't do this when I'm by myself but when you have a collective experience which is like a theatrical one or like a theatre theatre experience doesn't have to be whatever you want to call it uh you are there you're experiencing it with people around you so you feel like you're not so alone in your activism and you're not so alone in your experience which I would say is like why I think the two are so like aligned I think it's another like people like so many things to do with activism are such like big issues and it's so hard to digest I think theatre and like any form of like arts can make a, like something that's so big feel accessible and engaging um for for anyone and like everyone and in, and then in, then in terms of how how you can make sure that's not performative I think it's like that is so like rooted in keeping the conversation going like working out how you can like check in with your like community of people who you've shared your work with how you can like keep that conversation going outside of that space so it's like seen as like a start but it's not like just when people leave that they like that's something they experience, but they're not continuing to experience. So it's like a stimulating experience in someone. If that if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Really, really good, good stuff, guys. Yeah, I really completely agree with all of the points you guys have raised. Um, Abster, do you have anything to add on that question? Could you just repeat it for me, please, Georgina? Oh yeah, sure, of course. Uh, oh, I just scrolled. Um, where's it gone? Um. Why is it important to you to use theatre to speak out about political, social and environmental issues? What can young people do to make sure their creative activism isn't just performative? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so I think that for, for the, I think the starting point as, as some other people have already touched on is just knowing, knowing your why. Um, I think that art reflects life and you know, of course life is it has political social environmental issues and so these things are going to show up in your work naturally um and i think that to ensure that you are doing these story stories justice um that you just need to ensure that you care and that you consult and that you also include those who are affected if you're um ensuring that you're sorry if you're telling a story that isn't necessarily um one that you're always familiar with and I think there's a lot of debate around who has the right to tell which stories and I don't think there is actually a definitive answer um, I think it can sometimes be complex and layered but I think that um yeah just have that have those questions in your mind also I, I assume this has been everyone's experience as well just be prepared to do something for a really long amount of time. I think that projects are just so long, um, particularly if they're really engagement led or campaign led, um, they should be long because you should be interested in that sustained legacy of the project and thinking about what the different stages are. But it does mean sometimes it feels like you're, you're digging and you're not necessarily getting anywhere, but you are, you just have to keep tunneling for a really, really long time and be a bit obsessive about it and not be put off by how long change can take, I guess. Yeah, and as as well as that, theatre is something that is so um, uniquely live when it comes to storytelling. And so, why why theatre is another question. Why have you chosen this art form? And I think that what like what better space for community engagement and to get people when we can together in a room, um, or maybe not in a room, wherever you want to get people together, um, or however you want to engage people. But there's something about liveness that I think is um, so magical and it's just yours to hone. I guess like that, that thing of like, wherever you want that can be, that's like, 
I think that's such an important thing. Like, where are you sharing it? Like, how are you, like, you can't just expect audiences to come to you. And I think that's something that we're really, really, really like starting to work to do um, now with Pigfoot. It's like, well, we can say we want to reach these audiences, but you can't just then expect them to come to, like, we can't expect people to come to us. We need to be like, okay, so where are these audiences that we want to reach? Who is it who we want to share this message with? And how can we take our work to them? Because it's not, it's not anyone's responsibility to come to us. It's our responsibility. Um, to go to go to people and to like make people feel welcome by going to them because I think theatre as a place as a location is so inaccessible to so many people because they can't go or because they don't feel like it's for them and I think it's really important to make sure that you're taking theatre to spaces where where you where you are reaching those people lovely all right um uh, well, I've got some questions as well, as I said, um, that I was going to ask um, people individually. Um, I was going to direct one to Beth. Um, and my question is, um, blah, 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 where is it? Um, ah, here we go. How would you describe your role as a producer to those who might not fully understand what that role encompasses? Are there any other exciting roles in the th world of theatre which people sometimes overlook when some when starting out? Mm. I mean, being a producer is like it's it's got a lot of mist around it. I think a lot of people still don't really know what it is. And like I've been working as one for two to three years, and I still sometimes don't know, or it feels like I don't know. Um, I think ultimately, like to me, a producer is someone that supports an artist that they believe in it's it's again it's about that longevity it's about going like I'm not gonna sign up to do this and kind of invest in your ideas for two weeks you know and it's kind of like I think a producer is someone that is excited by the work that they see and it's kind of it goes back to kind of being like I think being a producer for me is so integral to my identity um and it's kind of sometimes it can get really hard to kind of go, is this who I am? And you start to like brand yourself, particularly as I'm freelance, you know, kind of I am my business, I am my organization. So I think that's something really interesting that producers face is going like, do I want to make this work? You know, does it feel right? And I actually feel like for me, it, it needs to feel right for me for me to really feel as though I can support that artist. Um, and as ever, I think it's about, yeah, and with that comes sustainability, going how can we sustain this relationship and how can I keep supporting you in a way that means I'm paid, you're paid, and we can both um, make work. Um, and I think as well, it's about being a yes man. I think being a producer, I wanna be that person that goes, yes, we can do that. We're gonna make it happen like X, Y, and Z. I think it's so important to do that and to hype people up um, and really, yeah. And again, really understand what that artist needs in order to be supported. Um, Rafia Hussain, also a um, independent producer has made a How I Work manifesto. And it is a godsend about being like, are we being transparent about our working hours? do you want to WhatsApp me at 11.30 at night? Absolutely not. Like knowing what's okay, I think as well is massive. Um, and I think it's also about managing expectation. Like sometimes you've got to go, we're making work in a pandemic. We can't travel to, we can't travel to, you know, bathing stoke. And, and it's, and it's rubbish to go. We can't do that, but it's also, it's part of the job managing those expectations. Um, in terms of other roles that I think are overlooked, um, for me, I feel like I've got a bit of experience definitely in stage management, venue management, and, and, and kind of um, being a technician. And I think for me, that's really elevated my practice. So I can also be really supportive in that and kind of really walk the artist through it and also have an opinion. I think often producers are the other people that do the admin. Whereas for me, if I'm not creatively involved or if I don't feel validated in the process, you're going to lose me because that's not I don't I don't want to do that so I think it's about also um having an awareness for all of the other roles in the room because it makes me understand the project as a whole and our team dynamic um but I think technicians project like project managers production managers like um stage managers like absolutely integral people and you just don't see schemes for stage managers you don't see like development programs for pr production managers and I think for me that's also really integral to kind of my activism as well going how can we make these backstage 
roles more visible. Um, yes. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. It's really, really good stuff. Um, okay, my next question is for Helen. Yeah, let's go with Helen. Um, so your company has said the show is just the beginning. The company wants to have an impact on policy. How does it have an impact on policy? And how important do you think that having a campaign attached to your plays is? And why did you decide to do that? So I think it definitely links back into kind of what we were saying about how the play is just the beginning. You know, everything before and after uh, is very attached to, to that. So what, what, what's your thoughts? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there was a while ago when we were going to write a formula for how you did it, and then we realised each project is completely different and you have to be really bespoke to each show. But just to give some examples, so our show Who Cares, which I talked about earlier, which was made with four young carers in Salford, we set up the Who Cares campaign alongside the show. And the kind of motivation for that was we toured it a couple of times and like I said, the aim was to identify hidden young carers. But then when we taught it to adult audiences or when there were teachers or parents in the space, they all at the end of the show really desperately, they don't just want to be told all this terrible stuff. They want to do something about it. And the young people that we'd made the show with wanted to be able to give them really tangible things they could do. So we set up the Who Cares campaign and um, we formed this working policy group as part of that. But like I was saying earlier, with sort of different people from lots of different fields of expertise who work with young carers to just write actually, what are your ideal policies around young carers that aren't currently in legislation? What do you want them to be? Um, and it's almost like a bit of a think tanky approach that then we try and really put like the next stage to try and practically implement those things in Salford where the play is made. So things like a lot of young carers say they want a young carer ID card, um, like a passport when they go into a pharmacy or when they're late for school. So people know there's a reason why they're late or they need to pick up their parents' prescription because they're actually the person caring for them. So there's those really practical things of actually just being like, what is it that we're trying to change with this production? Um, but like everybody's kind of touched on, I think Ab said it really well about the, the act of actually being in a physical space is an act of activism in itself. And honestly, you, the best time to get people is when they've just seen a show, like they really want to be doing something. So I do think having, before you've even put it in front of people, having what your aims are and what you're asking of your audience at the end, um, and not just, you know, in our case, telling them things that are happening that they have no control over, but actually trying to sort of have a bit of a hopeful outlook that if we kind of get together, here's, here are all these things happening around the show that you can that you can get involved with. Um, yeah, so I'd say that's how we kind of change policy. Uh, not that we've necessarily, like I was saying earlier, had any success, it's about the, di it's about the digging. Um, but having said that, there's small wins and we try now and perform all of our shows at Parliament. That's one of the things we've managed to kind of get in the door. And it's, I always think, have I sort of softened in my old age in the sense that I would normally be so anti-establishment that I wouldn't even want to be there. But as people have touched on, like actually how are you changing people's minds who don't already agree with you? And how are you, how are you opening up a dialogue that might be uncomfortable for both sides? Um, and it can be amazing. And quite electric when you get people who really disagree with each other in the same space. Um, so for example, with Trojan Horse, which is the show we just toured, um, there's, a pre there's a prevent review. So prevent the policy that's mandatory in schools and other education settings. Um, and, you know, in my opinion is incredibly racist as a policy. It really predominantly um, profiles Muslim students in schools, um, the referral, cases are much higher than the than the cases that are then followed up so it's a sort of anti um anti-terror legislation that that makes teachers essentially survey their students and there's a review happening into that at the moment and we're hoping that along with the show trojan horse trojan horse is the reason that prevent is mandatory in schools um and we don't believe trojan horse happened in the way that it was reported at the time and it's the only justification for why prevent exists um so using that alongside the prevent review so the the person who was chairing the prevent review we managed to persuade him to come and see the show which was amazing um he then got the old heave ho and they've actually brought in someone even more um you know 
racist and um, anti, you know, anti -Islam Islamophobic, essentially, to run the panel. So it's a bit of a, we feel like, oh, that's another way. We've brought this guy in and then he's been elbowed out and a new person's come in. But again, like trying to get that person in a space and telling them something that they might find uncomfortable in a way that actually feels potentially quite safe for them because they're in a theatre and it's a piece of art and there's a post-show discussion and they could have a gin and tonic and we'll have an open dialogue with them that's, um, yeah, that's less angry than us standing on the street shouting at them sorry I've completely rambled Georgina but that that's oh, how no, we try fine. and tie tie sort of policy in with the mm. actions of the show and um, but like I say it's just so yeah. different for every project depending on what I guess what's happening in in government mm. at the time and depending on what and what it is we're trying to make noise about amazing well yeah you uh, you answered the question really really well so that's that's great amazing um I think my next question would be for abs um why do you think storytelling can be transformative and what are the problems in popular mainstream storytelling for BIPOC communities yeah so I think I touched on some of this when I um spoke about um why I make work but I'll delve into it a little bit more um so I think that often when we watch ourselves on screen you see tropes or you see stereotypes um like for instance um for black women it's always the like light skin booty shaking girl and then the dark skin side friend who's undesirable um and it's it's harmful it's really harmful when these um ideas are perpetuated um and that's that's why represent that's part of why representation is so important um and i think that as much as stories can do damage they can do do good um i'm i'm currently reading a book um which is about um, it's called story making and education and therapy um and it groups the different um myths that are told around the world and they essentially all have um like themes or um morals or threads running through them so they're grouped into like beginnings trees knots passages um and it's just it's such a captivating book and, and what it kind of takes you through is that all of the um all of the myths that have beginnings at the core of them um will have some sort of thread some sort of similarity um and these are stories that we've come up, we've come up with separately around the world, like separate cultures, um, from India to Nigeria. We've 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 come up with these stories that independently do the same thing. Um, like for instance, bedtime stories um, typically um, tell the story of a protagonist who goes on a really scary journey that they're not prepared for. Um, and they eventually overcome, and then that reassures the, the future dreamer that they can go on their mission or go to sleep and face the unknown that lies ahead, and it reassures. And I think sometimes storytelling, um, sometimes it does, it does, sometimes you think you're just seeing something that's, that's like making you laugh or it's doing this thing, but there's, there's a real power and a, a pattern and a, a method to it all. Um, that I'm still unpicking and still I'm, st and I'm still learning about myself um, but it like it's storytelling is used in therapeutic spaces um, stories connect us um, again we've we've touched on about who we're trying to reach with our audiences but um, storytelling gives us an insight into one another's worlds we're so disconnected and I think for the most part people are pretty consumed with their own issues uh, which I think is natural. I think that it, it, I think that it has its limitations, and that we need to become more conscious of of one another's struggles. But I think that sometimes, like if if I tell you, or you know, you hear, or I don't know, you 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 get like a an insight. It's it's not it's not quite as rich as you going into like a space or, you know, suspending belief and being immersed into the world and then going on this journey with this character. Um, and I just think it, it, um, it encourages empathy and it reflects society 
in a way that can be challenging in the most evocative um, and and beautiful way. And I think um, you know I'm talking about some real like some some broad deep things here, but it really is just the tip of the iceberg. Like it, you can use storytelling to heal trauma. There are so many ways. Um, yeah, save the arts. <laughs> I agree there. Amazing stuff. Thank you so much. Um, uh, who have I not asked an individual question? Hetty. Yes, Hetty. Um, I've got a really good question here. So how do you think mainstream theatre and production companies can use your model of carbon neutral theatre? And how important is it that the next generation of theatre makers follow your lead? Um, so I think to um, say, to start off with, and the second part of that question, how important is that the next generation of theatre makers follow our lead? I think that there won't be much of a choice. I think that the industry like really needs to change now because the climate crisis is so, so urgent that like the climate, that the theatre industry needs to be changing right now. And that can come from below. It can come from pressure from below, but so much of the, um, carbon impact comes from like larger bigger organizations as well so we as like early career artists emerging theatre makers whatever you want to call it like we what we can do is sort of protest I guess we can we can put pressure on wider large organizations um, to change what they're doing you can't do everything but for example for a larger organization what you can do is you can switch energy providers so I literally today was writing a email to rehearsal venues that we've worked with asking them to change the energy provider because we can't change the energy provider they can change the energy provider so we need resources but we can't use resources that are having an effect on the planet so for example our most recent show hot in here when we were streaming it our carbon neutral technology the dance floor isn't fully complete yet so we can't use it to power the show so when we were um doing our work in progress we did it in Kentish Town City Farm which is a solar powered organization so we can't be in an arts venue because they are having such an impact on the planet so the venues really need to be changing part of it is because of the UK like the western world's obsession with fossil fuels and we are we like live in a society which is so powered by fossil fuels and is innately unsustainable but we as an arts industry need to change the way that we are using resources and um it's yeah it's just like i don't think that the next generation will necessarily have a choice i think it will have had to change um or, or it will have to have been changed um i think that you can say like i think it's as i said at the beginning it's impossible to do everything and I think it's very easy to be overwhelmed, but it's important to be starting from somewhere and asking that question. So for example, if you're a company to be having like, as you would have production meetings to have um, like sustainability meetings. So like, what are we doing to make this production, this specific production more sustainable than the last? I think for larger organizations, you can, you should have someone who is their literal job to hold people accountable um, within the organization to, make the, the work as sustainable as possible um, and it's also so important that if you're a large organization and if you're a smaller organization because it's not too hard to do and I think this information needs to become it's something we're really trying to do with Pigfoot like as accessible to other companies and like share that work but large organizations really need to be calculating the carbon footprint of their work so that they can hold themselves accountable and that's their work and also their communities so for example how much is like driving people like what's the carbon footprint of that so how we encourage encouraging people in their daily lives as well wider and outside of theatre um, to have like less of a carbon footprint um, and then once you've calculated what your carbon footprint is you can work out how you can make it smaller because if you don't know then like why would you why would why would you check like why would you change so you need to like edit so all the large, large organizations need to educate themselves as to the carbon impact of their work and they need to be questioning it and like as yeah as i say i would you just can't you can't do everything to start off with but by changing one thing so for example if you're one large organization and you say okay we will not be doing print for this what does that mean for you? How can you creatively adapt to something that's like creatively exciting? How can you see problems as a creatively exciting opportunity? Um, and then how does that allow you to lessen your carbon footprint? Okay, we've done that. What can we do next? What can we do next? What can we do next? So it's constantly looking for it rather than just assuming that it will come to you. 
Um, and that is my answer to the question. <laughs> Amazing stuff. No, I completely agree. It's really interesting stuff, definitely about uh, what Pigfoot do with, with carbon neutrality and, and trying to like quantify what it actually means in, in the in the bigger scope of things. So thank you. Um, so yeah, I've asked questions for everyone specifically um, on uh, what they do. Um, I thought as we're in Women's History Month, it would be remiss to ask, uh, what obstacles, if any, uh, have you felt being a woman um, in the in the theatre industry has like brought you uh, have there been any benefits any drawbacks uh, whoever wants to go first can start us off okay, oh, okay. No, no, you go first you go you go <laughs> you start speaking <laughs> <laughs> all right fine 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 um do you know what it's honestly it's so hard for me to like like to to because like sometimes I'm sitting in a room I'm actually looking around and I'm like is it because I'm black is it because I'm a woman is it because I'm young is it because I'm working class or is it because I'm a black young working class woman I'm like and I and I think it really is just impossible to separate them all, <laughs> <It's> all <right. laughs> um <laughs> um but I think um I think as a director, it can be really challenging um, when you're holding a room. I think that actually, um, I don't, I don't want to stereotype, but based on my experiences, I've found it even more challenging with older generations, um, which I think maybe says that there's some sort of positive shift. Um, and I think that one thing I'm kind of working on remembering is that I, like how other people feel, what other people think is not my responsibility. Um, and I can only be accountable to myself for my own thoughts. And I think that a big part of it actually is that, um, here I go stereotyping again, but as women, we, we're conditioned to shrink. We're conditioned to accommodate it literally broke my heart. I was doing a workshop in a primary school um, and it was literally like, okay, everyone go and sit on the bench. All the boys went and rushed to the bench. And then the girls, like they just moved out of the way. They didn't even try, they were, some of the girls, the bench was empty and they sat straight on the floor. And it wasn't because they didn't want to sit on the bench. It was because they were just being accommodated. And I literally, I like nearly choked because I was like, you lot are six you're six and you've already learned not to take up space and so and so I think like part of it is just like coaxing yourself as a woman and knowing that my voice is valid being bossy isn't a thing like I'm a boss ass b can I say ass I said ass uh, <laughs> I said b though <laughs> I did um <laughs> yeah and so I think um yeah it's it's hard because of the external and it's additionally challenging sometimes because of the internal um but there's just a lot of unlearning to be done anyone else um i think the first thing that sprung to my mind was um because i drag king and perform alongside producing that like it's kind of back to the idea of community like I really situate myself within the queer community and like my friends are very much like me like we all kind of believe in the same stuff we all like the same things and when I'm performing when I do a gig so if I, I kind of performed at Vault Festival Bethnal Green Working Men's Club and I've tried to kind of do the the London cabaret scene it involves me dressing up as a drag king. I think my dad's actually watching and he might be here, but I actually really look like my dad when I do this. So hi dad. Um, is that I dress up as I dress up as a gorilla and then like strip it off and it's to Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses. And it's kind of like a metaphor for how corporate men are like gorillas and how we all live in an animal kingdom. Um, I've ruined the show, I'm sorry guys. Um, but I would do that and I'd come off stage and I'd feel amazing, I'd feel so excited. And then it would come to come going home, getting a cab home or getting a train or walking home. And I would like, I would never ever walk home on my own with my makeup on. I'd never walk home on my own in my, like dressed as a drag king because I'd be too scared to 
be seen, be picked on. Like it's happened before where people just kind of like, particularly again, and with abs on this, I don't mean to stereotype, but also it is older men that that pick on you that because you they're like, oh, you're trying to look like a man. And, you know, and it's really, it's really bad. Like I've just spent the best part of three and a half minutes doing what I love and kind of like expressing myself but then when it actually comes to getting off stage and going home I can't do that so I think as well it's about thinking about how actually amazing the spaces that we have the cabaret spaces the theatres even the the lovely zoom rooms like this one where we can be super open I think it's those places that you know really just are absolutely a staple in making theatre, in being a woman, in being queer, in being working class, you know, all of those intersections that make up who we are, I think is, yeah, so needed. And I'm also, yeah, I just think, yeah, it's really hard, but. Yeah, just to follow on, like, I think that's my favorite thing is getting to work with really amazing women as well. And I do, I agree with Beth, I'm in such a bubble. And when that bubble gets broken, it can sometimes be a bit harsher because you sort of realise, oh my God, I'm just surrounded by all these incredible women all the time who share my opinion about everything. And also are all exceptional at their job. Like, I don't know, again, sorry to stereotype, but women just get stuff done and there's often no ego and people work really well together and are really empathetic and understanding. And I'm just really lucky within my company that, you know, we're predominantly really strong, but also really kind, brilliant women. And um, yeah, shout out to all of them. It's an absolute privilege to get to work with them all. So that's me. Yeah, and just to jump in, I feel, always feel like before I answer a question like this, I need to, um, so like I'm like privileged in so many ways, like I'm white and middle-class, I'm able-bodied and cisgendered, um, but still as a woman, I feel like I'm saying sorry the whole time like I like find it so well someone actually noticed it in me who I started working with as she was a writer I'm a director and she was like Hetty you genuinely don't know you stop saying sorry like you say it the whole time and you don't need to say sorry so now I'm like super aware of the amount of times I say sorry because you're saying sorry for nothing like what are you apologizing for you've not hurt as long uh, in my opinion you shouldn't apologize unless you've like hurt or offended or like harmed anyone in any way if, if you haven't then you've got no reason to apologize as long as you're not negatively affecting someone else or like the world in which we live um if you like sorry i've just tripped up or sorry i like, just spilled a drink like no ma man would apologize for that for literally just like being there in the space and i think that is like a big thing that I've noticed in a lot of um, women and who I know and have worked with. And I think it's about feeling like you're taking up space. Um, and, but there's like, as, as you guys all said, uh, there's so many benefits. I've just like been really lucky and come out of a rehearsal room, which just been like amazing women. And one of um, them who we've worked with, um, with like brought up this comment in the, on the last day talking about like, feminist leadership styles um which is so much to do with like leadership being collaboratively shared um or oh, that's what i felt in my experiences with working with some like such wonderful women um who don't feel like they need to take all authority for themselves i think women do like a really amazing thing of like listening um that's so stereotypical but i think women listen really well uh, they share leadership and they care for each other and i think that is like a really amazing thing about uh being a woman and being able to work with women does anyone else have this as well i feel like you're constantly underestimated which i know is an awful thing but i secretly really love because you always just surprise people when you're really great like and it also happens because i look really young and it happens particularly because all of our work is really interview based we'll often get in rooms with people you know in the house of lords or who are really influential and they'll think that i'm doing a school project and they'll actually be really candid with me and tell me lots of stuff that they probably wouldn't tell me if I was a man in a suit and then I get you know I get there I get that side of them that's a bit like flippant because they don't think I'm going to do anything substantial with it and then suddenly you're like <laughs> not yeah not that we try and get anyone but you know pe you know there's that kind there are flip sides to people really underestimating you and 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 having lower expectations of you because you can really surprise them which I always secretly like to do until it comes to the coin Absolutely. And uh, comes to the coin. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys um, for yeah um, uh, contributing to that last answer. We do actually have, so we've got about 15 minutes left. We do have two questions on the Q&A. Uh, one question we've got from Hannah Akalu. I hope I said that right. Fingers crossed. Um, it says, uh, I'm about to graduate from drama school and I'm planning on being both an actor and children young people's practice theatre practitioner a lot of people are saying I should only focus on one but I really want to do both do you think it's possible to do both well especially as a new grad or should I just focus on one go on I saw this one in the chat and it literally just was grinding my gears I've been waiting for it <laughs> because People give such <laughs> bad advice and I don't know who gave you that advice. So sorry to that man or person. Um, but like, it's really your life, first of all. And it's actually, it's, it, it even is just bad advice because as an actor, like often starting out, there are moments when you're not working as an actor and what better thing than to have like more tools to your toolkit like as a freelance artist it's so beneficial to know like so I can go and direct I can go and produce I can do film I can do theatre and like if I relied on one my bank account wouldn't be as happy and like and 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 not only that they feed one another so your work um I'm going to quote you as a young people's theatre practitioner that's gonna inform your acting. You're gonna learn so much and the two will just feed each other in the most beautiful way. Um, and yeah, I don't know what that person's intention was with their advice, but um, often people project their own fears onto you. Um, and like, I just want everybody here to know that there are absolutely no limitations to what you can do. If you wanna be a pilot and an actor, do it. Like whatever you wanna do, you can do it and just always follow your heart and your heart will not lead you astray. Yeah, I had a big in instinct on this. I was like, absolutely do both. When you said, I really want to do both. I was like, ding, ding, ding. Like you've answered that question already. I mean, I think definitely what Abs has said. And I think there's like this weird stigma of like you having one main discipline and then the rest is like side hustle. And it's like, no, 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 none of it's side hustle. Like it's all just my discipline. And I think that the more we try and break down that stigma, the better. And I think as well, it's kind of, yeah, what Abs was saying was it, you can be a pilot and kind of be an artist. Like I literally first year of uni to fund me going to Edinburgh Fringe to perform. I worked in Greg's, turned on the ovens at 5 a.m. And I'm not joking because that's what we have to do. And like, I just think regardless whether it's in the arts or not, you need to kind of test yourself as well. And even if you're like, I'm losing my marbles, like I'm finding this really, really hard to kind of structure and kind of do both at the same time, like baby steps is still progress. You don't need to learn everything overnight and you can prioritize one thing, but that doesn't mean to say that you're gonna forget about the other one. Um, and I think go go with your gut. Like if, if you really wanna do both, believe in yourself and, and do it for sure. I think what you were saying earlier, Beth, I don't want to take your words out of your mouth because you said them way better than me. Um, it was so important about like be, being a producer, but also having like experience being a te like technician, a stage manager and being able to like understand those roles and like what it feels to be like someone in those roles. Because like I would say I'm a director and a producer. Um, and for me, like as a director, I'm like so... I feel like it makes me hyper aware of like what I'd like as a producer and how I'd like to like work within like having creative input and all these and all these things and as a producer what I feel like I need as a director so I think it's like so invaluable and I had so many people tell me being like well they're not the same job just like within theatre but they are they are so similar like as a producer I ask my like as a director I ask myself like who's this who's this for what am I making this like show who am I making the show for and as a producer I'm like how am I going to get those people into it like there's two things aren't mutually exclusive and also as 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 abs and beth were both saying like it's you can't like i, I don't like can't i like right, right now i can't even just direct and produce i had to do, like load of other jobs so like, if i'm going to be doing any any jobs at all or get money like i want them to be in theater like whatever they are like i have a good time like it'll be great and you can like constantly be learning and evolving and it's yeah i just think that's like such an important thing like just whatever whatever jobs you want to do then you can do it and there'll be a, like, the reason why you want to do it will uh, like be the reason why you ex exceed 
excel exceed is that the word excel <laughs> Um, exceed, exhale. <laughs> also, so I, so I do both those. I'm an actor with one hat and co artistic director of Lung with the other hat. And a lot of the work that I do is youth focused and run a youth group and participate to rework and stuff like that. The things I would say is some casting directors do not want to hear about it. That's been a big lesson that I've learned is actually just judge if you're going in for a TV casting and actually they kind of want to focus on the TV show. Sometimes they'll ask you how you are and I go, well, you'll never guess who I just met on my, you know, doing my interview and then I tell them a big story and actually I've learned to sometimes pretend that you don't do both to the people who don't get it. Um, my agents are really, really supportive, but some agents would rather that you just acting because they think that it confuses things. And I think, don't feel like you have to tell your agent everything and it's your life to juggle, they work for you. And um, if you've got people who are slightly clouding that, then just keep it to yourself. And the other thing I would say is, again, it's about teamwork. So I work with a really amazing team and I have a co-artistic director, which actually I found really useful because it does mean if I suddenly need to go and film for three months and you know if that is what you're aiming for if you want to be an actor where you have got that flexibility to go then you're sharing the load with somebody that you really trust who can take the work but also if you're like running a youth group group for example that you don't feel like you're going to suddenly be abandoning um abandoning the young people because you you're choosing to go and do that thing because there is a lot of guilt I think that I find comes with doing both but having said that you know that's that's maybe one job every three years where you're going to get, get getting to go and film for three months like most of the time it absolutely works and like everybody has said feed, feeds into each other but yeah just to echo I think we're pretty unanimous that you should definitely follow your gut and do both do both things amazing oh thank you so much everyone we're rallying behind this uh almost graduate so yes we really hope that uh, that you uh, take heed of all those words um oh you're welcome Hannah um so we've got like seven minutes before we meant to finish I've got one more question that was in the Q&A um which I think really feeds into um what we were discussing about you know uh kind of this echo chamber kind of you know we we've we've got all of this um all of this rallying support and amazing people around us but then when we kind of get into the real world and then everything kind of shatters around us it makes us it can be quite a harsh um falling down so uh, how can we avoid this bubble effect? A lot of people who tend to come to shows already care about the subject uh, and already go to the theatre to, to hear these ideas. In what ways do you try to reach those who might not usually engage with the theatre and two, with the ideas you're trying to convey? So anyone can jump in here. I think that is such a good question. It's definitely like a big problem that we find. It's like you are just, you are just shouting into echo chambers sometimes if you're just going to like like traditional theatre venues or whatever I think for us it's about where you're taking your work so for us it's like starting to take work into schools but with climate work actually this, we're finding like the schools that we take the shows into they do actually like we're taking it to young people and we're taking like how to save rock we're taking to like year fives and year sixes and genuinely they know so much about the climate crisis and I think that is just like um make like it's so clear um that like that is such an urgent thing whenever we go there but I think for us then when we take it to schools it's about like giving them hope and giving them solutions and allowing them to feel empowered so there is a purpose there but then we just did our work in progress the other day and I was just reading through one of the feedback forms and someone was like why don't you take this into big businesses and I was like yes that's that's such a good idea because they're the people who ho not hold the opposite view obviously I'm sure there's lots of people in big businesses who do care about the climate um but they are the opposite of what, of what we want to say um so that's like thinking about where you're taking it, like thinking about where you are taking your activism, who it is that you want to listen and taking it to them. If they're not just gonna to come to you, then yeah, making sure that you're proactive in where you're going, what you're doing. Um, I think for me, it's kind of more about what 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 is the work in terms of like, how can it manifest in a really diverse and inclusive way? So like, I really like working across theater cabaret and live events just because it really opens up to the people that I get to engage with. So, you know, the people that come to the theatre aren't necessarily pe the people that are coming to the gorilla drag night, you know? So I think it's kind of thinking about ways in which we can really actually open up the work to kind of acknowledge this bubble and actually go, how can we break it down? Um, and I actually think that now with all this kind of digital theatre making, like 
I think the the best part of theatre is the fact that it's being live, but I also think we should capitalise on the opportunity of actually going, okay, how can we do this differently in a way which is still really exciting, but reaches different people. And I think that also with COVID, it's like, you know, not everyone has internet connection, not everyone has a laptop which in itself is a massive, massive problem. But I think it is kind of also going back to the drawing board and a lot of things and going like, is the way that we're doing this actually engaging with the people that we want it to? And I think it's kind of like a catch 22 because you want to make the show that you want to make, but also you want to engage with a really diverse audience in a really inclusive and genuine way. So, I mean, I just kind of love the excitement that comes between cabaret live events and theatre. And I would kind of, to tell anyone to kind of try and open your mind a little bit more and kind of does it have to be theatre or what even is that label what does that even mean um and kind of think of it like that and just kind of really have an open mind I think um I would say building it into your budget from the inception of a project because you know outreach and engagement as we call it costs a lot of money and something we do is we make it really clear at the beginning in our deals with venues like we are asking please can you put this amount of tickets aside that will be for free um please can you provide a coach to the venue for people who are in this area because we want them to come and often you know a lot of venues say yes because they're also interested in audience development but if they don't at least you've made the ask and you've you know you've taken that um step the other thing we've started doing but again it costs money but it is I just think so successful is we always attach an engagement manager to every tour and their job is to be on the ground on the tour and all they're doing is aud uh, audience development and workshops around the show and thinking about who's coming in the door and greeting those people as they're coming in the door and having that one person who's like really across that can be great because it means you're not kind of tagging it on or trying to do it as one of your other 50 things but there's a bespoke person who's you know that's their whole job and if you've decided from the very beginning who the people are that you're trying to reach and they're they've got that shared aim with you um that can be really great and i agree with hetty as well going going somewhere else and what we found i don't know if you found this hetty if you've partnered with a venue that you're touring to to telling them that you're doing it also in a community hall down the road they often want to get involved give you lights and equipment give you a bus to get your actors there or whatever and um i think again building that into your tour schedule so it's not like an add-on thing or a separate thing but it's like we're doing the performance in the space on that day and then we're taking it down the road at the weekend yeah yeah this question like when you find out the answer let me know because like it honestly feels like one of my um biggest frustrations with with theater i like I, I'm not going to make up a statistic, but I heard this statistic about like the the number of um, or the percentage of audience members um, in off West End shows. Um, I think it's more like at smaller venues who are actually just theatre makers. It literally made me vomit, not literally, but it made me vomit um, because like I'm I'm not making work for you lot. Like you kind of like <laughs> you just not. <laughs> my audience like it's it's nice if you come and I appreciate the support but the people that I'm trying to speak to aren't theatre makers because I think that theatre makers do inherently um have a like I think there's a there's this idea which is false that um people who work in theatre are so liberal or whatever that's absolutely a lie but I think at, at the very least theatre makers have a um consciousness of the world um, because that's what we do we engage with the world in really interesting ways um yeah I I don't know these these lot came up with some great suggestions um and I think I've had a lot of interesting conversations around it and I've I've kind of picked up that it's not actually always ticket prices that are, is the thing that's um that's um getting people like not want excluding people um because the same people who you can't get to go to your show are paying 100 to see Beyonce so yeah I think it's actually more about like targeting and, and people knowing that th this is for them they are welcome um and the weird kind of policing that goes on in theatres and the the idea like if you ask a lot of people what theatre is they're going to tell you it's it's white and it's Shakespeare um and obviously that isn't always the case so yeah I don't know 
help. Okay. <laughs> Bless you. All right. Amazing. Oh, it is. It is just gone 830. Um, so we do have to wrap up this fantastic thing. I just want to say a massive thank you to every panelist that's um, appeared on our webinar today. It's been so fantastic to uh, hear from everybody um, and their experiences. So thank you for taking the time out. I just before we all go, I would love it if everybody uh, starting with abs just plugs their next project what are you looking forward to next so abs do you want to go first yes so um super duper uper guest um that my first um short film well my first narrative short film um has just been acquired by bbc so it aired on bbc2 on sunday and now it's on the iplayer for a year so go um just type crown and you'll find it just go I play a crown and you'll find it. Um, Amazing. So yeah, hope you enjoy it. And that's a Uproot and Phases Collective co-production. <laughs> okay, uh, Hetty, what is coming up next for you? So we are making this digital tour of uh, our family show, How to Save a Rock, which we're gonna take to stream to schools, but also publicly through venues. Um, and we're also developing our new mm. show pot in here which hopefully will be able to happen at some point, who knows when, um, but, but it's being developed. So that's happening, um, yeah. Amazing, amazing. Beth, what's next for you? Um, an artist that I'm working with called Bonnie Adair. She has a, um, a sharing at the Actors Centre, a digital one, of course, the best theatre in the world, Zoom. Um, that is happening at the end of this month. It's going to be streaming I think, you no, know, we're filming on the 26th and then we're we're going live on the Actors Centre website on the 1st of April. It's called Normalcy and it's about lived experience of coming out, being bisexual and your family kind of having a bit, bit of an opinion on that and actually how the people closest to us can actually be the biggest judges. But it's going to be stunning. So yes, we'd love to see some friendly faces. Amazing. And last but not least, Helen, what's next for you? Um, I'm trying to think. So well, Who Cares, which I've talked about a lot today, has just been on BBC Radio 4. It's a radio show and that's up on BBC Sound. So you can listen to it. And alongside that, um, with the Who Cares campaign, one of the things that obviously young carers have been really, really impacted by COVID and their caring responsibilities have gone up, but also their disproportionately from low-income families and have been really affected by digital poverty. So we've launched a fund called the Digi Fund and we're trying to raise £5,000 um, for young carers to get them laptops and Wi-Fi. So if anyone knows anyone with a disposable income, um, if you go to our website, Lung Theatre, and tell them to check us a five or whatever, um, that would be amazing. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and all of our uh, attendees that have come on to the webinar, thank you for listening. One just very quick thing, uh, just in like how we phrase some of our um, uh, for, for the event tonight, we did use the, the term woman with the X in uh, in place of the A. We just want to clarify that obviously we've, we've heard a lot of um, using this, this term in negative ways in anti-trans um, organizations and communities. We just wanna clarify that we, we're, we're, we weren't using that as like uh, an anti-inclusive term. We, we wanted that to be inclusive, um, but we do recognize that, that sometimes um, that has been used in the wrong context. We just wanted to let everyone know, but thank you so much everybody for coming. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.